Good morning. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Oh, you should be. I always like Michael Caine. He's always... I've never seen him in a bad movie. I can tell you one. Okay. Blame it on Rio. Okay, I don't think I've seen Blame It on Rio. Joe Bologna, a very young Demi Moore. Okay. And another actress who just disappeared in terms of, I don't know, I don't know her name. She was one of the, I think she was like the main actress in the movie. But it is, and also, uh, I think Valerie Harper was also in that movie. It is is one of the most forgettable movies. Is this the one that ruined Demi Moore's trajectory? It's quite possible because it was that bad of a movie, but... I just read about this. It, she was very young, so okay. I don't know that it would have ruined because she did a lot of stuff after that. All right, there was a lot of movies that followed. I think it might have been. Oh no, it was the striptease one. That's that was what, the that's, one. That's the one that ruined. G.I. Jane probably didn't help right. either. Right. No, G.I. Jane was supposed to be the one to fix it after yeah. striptease. Uh, Saint Elmo's Fire was, uh, you know, maybe the that's the, the one that launched her. That's the height of the career, right, right there. Blame it on Rio starts the, <laughs> the rapid trajectory south. Our guest. Uh, in this segment is a candidate for Congress, Alex Gasserud. Good morning, Mr. Alex. How are you? Good morning, Rob. How are you? Did I keep hearing you say a young Demi Moore? Yes, she was young at the time. <laughs> young because it goes back before you were born, probably, Alex. <laughs> hey, I've seen St. Elmo's Fire, but uh, the other one I didn't. Yeah, but you, you didn't see it when it came out like I did, though, did you? No, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, at, at that time, right around that time, was uh, I, I moved to Northern Virginia in 86, I think. And it was, I, don't, I can't remember when that movie came out exactly, what year it was. It might have been just before that. But that was, uh, you know, you'd, you'd save up as much as you possibly could to go out in Georgetown as a young person for a night. And then that took care of all that months of money sa- you took to save money to go out in Georgetown that night. It was an expensive place. Yes. Still is. Yeah, it's only gotten worse. And you spent your money on St. Elmo's Fire? No, you go you go bar hopping. Oh, okay. Georgetown, all right. Right? Yeah. Right? All right. You stop in all the places. Yeah. You go see where the priest got pushed pushed down the, uh, yes, the stairs. Oh, the exorcist steps. Yeah. Absolutely. Got to see the exorcist steps. Right next steps. to Dixie Liquors. <laughs> right? I mean, if you don't see the exorcist <laughs> yeah. steps, what's the sense of being Exactly. There? You got to go. You got to go. Uh, Alex, uh, we are, what, two months away from primary day. In fact, this is May the 14th, which marks the, uh, the beginning of the 60-day period before elections when uh, equal time kicks in for all uh, candidates. So, Alex, how much noise are you making out there? I've been making noise. I've been making noise uh, as well as I can. Um, so we just had a debate. Uh, it wasn't really a debate. It was more or less a town hall uh, where a moderator asked questions. Um, and, and it's clear after listening to that presentation in Harrison County this Saturday that the only two people that have any business being in this race from a knowledge standpoint is myself and Treasurer Moore. Um, so I, I got a lot of rave reviews from that performance. Um, and and uh, I'm, I'm obviously, I have signs in all counties now. Uh, we're, we're all over the place right now uh, with, our, with our visual representation of our campaign. Um, somebody called me the other day and said, how many signs have you bought? My goodness, actually, I'm seeing them everywhere. And uh, it's 27 counties uh, the district you know, encompasses, so, so we've been out and about for, for a long time now. So unfortunately, I'm running this campaign more like Richard Nixon ran his first couple campaigns and not so much like Jack Kennedy ran his campaigns or, or it would be a little different. But uh, we, haven't, we haven't raised the money we would need to, to really get on the airwaves the right way. What separates you from your competition in this, Alex? Well, I'm I'm a generational change. I'm also somebody that knows the problems of the country, knows how to fix them. Um, we have to stand up now and take on the leftism. We have to stand up now and tackle the debt, get back to regular order in the U.S. Congress. We can't allow for the United States to continue to be pushed around by nations like China, Russia, Iran. We've got a lot of problems here at home. Um, an economy that's that's very difficult for, for the average American today continues to get worse uh, under this treasonous administration. And I know how to go there and, and, and fight. And, and I think West Virginians have a, have a real chance here to send somebody that's going to get results for the district, but also is going to help get the country back on track. Uh, so I would say my ceiling for results to the district and getting the country uh, fixed is much higher than any of my opponents. Alex, who inspired you politically, and is there anybody that you sort of model yourself after as you run for office? Not so much that I model myself after. I've, I've 
I kind of have my own independent thought and uh, streak. I'm not trying to imitate anyone or, or really model my campaign after any particular campaign or politician or anything like that. But, you know, I've been, I've been influenced by conservative thought, you know, and Rand influenced me, uh, Edmund Burke. Uh, influenced me, you know, so, so there's there's some philosophical influences, obviously, you know, that, that my conservatism stems from. Of course, the founders, I would say, is probably the biggest influence on me. Um, and, and then, of course, there's some more recent uh, politicians, obviously, Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, and then, of course, uh, Donald Trump. Uh, that's that's probably the most recent one. You know, big fan of Jack Kennedy, obviously. Um, you know, Abraham Lincoln. There's a lot of different Lee Atwater. I mean, there's a lot of different people that have influenced me politically in my life through through watching them and reading about them and, and learning and studying politics. Nixon's an interesting choice because obviously the way his term ended, but a, a lot of things that we uh, do today and a lot of the things that are in place are a direct result of the Nixon administration. So it's interesting that you would you would point out Richard Nixon and the people that you named right there, Alex. Yeah, so Richard Nixon, it's it's more of his um, political career, not so much what he accomplished in the presidency, not so much what he you know accomplished in office. Uh, it, it's more or less how he didn't listen to the elites. He didn't listen to what the traditional metrics were when he first started running his races. Uh, you know, he ran races without money, kind of like I'm running now. Um, you know, Richard Nixon has a great quote, you know, the, the finest steel has to go through the hottest fire. And uh, there's a lot of respect that I have for Richard Nixon and his political prowess, uh, the way that he got back up and fought after being kicked down, um, the way that he was able to, to run campaigns successfully with no money. Um, you know, after after you know s- some different different races, so it wouldn't be so much policy or his performance as a president or what he did or the sort of surly character that he he is, as you can see in the tapes that 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 depict him. But it's more or less his his fight politically. He's not going to let the elite. He's not going to let the establishment uh, step on him, and he's not going to listen to people that say don't do this because you don't have the money or you don't have the name or you don't have the polling data. It's, it's bigger than that. Saving the country and standing up to, to, to fix this nation now is bigger than the elites and all the uh, you know, traditional political metrics. Alex Gasserud, our guest here on the program, candidate for Congress, and this is the seat that Alex Mooney currently holds. Alex, uh, we've interviewed you, I think, four times now, so I didn't uh, do the uh, background and intros and where you're from kind of stuff, but there are a couple of questions in our Facebook comments section about that. So let's circle back and tell us a little bit about who Alex uh, Gastrude is and where he comes from. Definitely. Born and raised in Elkins, West Virginia, a native West Virginian. Um, was a three-sport athlete in high school, all-state baseball player, uh, captain of my basketball team. I was a three-time Hand of the Week award winner uh, on North Central West Virginia um, television uh, means I had the best catch that Friday night in the state of West Virginia. I, I, I won that with two catches on three different networks. Um, the same catch counted twice. Uh, I started a young Republican club in my high school. There was a young Democrat club in 2008. Um, I felt that we needed to have a young Republican club, and I was able to uh, recruit roughly 60 members. They paid dues. They learned what it was to be Republican. They learned uh, what the Teenage Republican Society at that time was messaging. Um, they also, you know, we debated the Young Democrats, and it wasn't just me debating everybody. I had other people, you know, there were different members that debated people. We did political canvassing, door knocking, candidate activities. Um, so, so that was something that was, you know, really successful. Unfortunately, the club only lasted for a couple of years after I, I graduated from Elkins High School. And then I went on and got a degree uh, in political science from Davidson Elkins College, where both my parents attended. Uh, my father's from Northern Virginia. My mother's native to Elkins. They met at college, so that's, that's kind of how I ended up in Elkins, um, went there uh, and got a degree in political science, was on my debate team, and, and learned, uh, learned a lot about the left, about their ideology, about the neo-Marxist control uh, that they're bringing to, to the society. And this was, this was 10, 10 plus years ago now, or just about 10 years ago. Um, and and, and that's, that's really where I hail from. You know, I, I'm a native West Virginian, and, and I was a typical American boy. Uh, that was politically motivated, played sports, you know, got a degree, and and uh, now I'm trying to 
trying to help my country and help my state. Let's. See, you mentioned Karl Marx there and Marxism. He died this date, 1883, uh, by the way. What Marxist influences do you see in our society? Well, the, the main Marxist influence, there's a couple different rails of it, but the main is the dissolution of capitalism. Uh, the, the Marxist today, the new Marxist, is, is bent on continuing to erode our capitalistic foundation. Uh, they believe that capitalism is wrong, that, that you're not really free to make decisions, you're, you're forced to work, uh, your, your labor is exploited by the owners of production, and the more that they can undermine that system and the less free market capitalism and the more diluted and, and state government, uh, excuse me, uh, big government uh, control, uh, you know, they're trying to dissolve, dissolve capitalism, obviously. So we have to stand up against that. So, so they want to threaten our very economic system. That's one of the central tenets of Marx. They're not going to be able to have a successful uh, communist revolution until, until they overthrow the capitalistic system. Uh, so, so they're they're constantly doing that, trying to trying to uh, undermine the system by by creating more state control of the economy. Uh, we do not have a true capitalistic system. We we have a, a, a very heavy-handed state now that's involved. You look at all the different taxes we pay. Uh, would be a great example of that. Um, another tenet of Marxism, and this is this is somewhat of a new tenet that has been brought on, is is the division through uh, social ideology, the division through race, class, ethnicity. That's super important for Marxism to thrive and for it to, to ultimately work, is you have to have the society pitted against each other. You have to say, Alex, you're a 31-year-old white male, and because you happen to be born white, you have to pay more, even though you didn't own slaves and and uh, you, you know, you didn't have anything to do with that. You were born in 1992, but we need to penalize you uh, and and make you pay for the previous historical injustices. Uh, so, so the central tenet of Marxism is to take and to redistribute. And the more that they can take and redistribute, the the, the stronger their system becomes, and the harder it will be uh, to, to ultimately uh, break it. Um, the transgender issue is something that they use quite a bit now as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of a, a lot of problems that we see today uh, because of of how Marxism has been taught for 30 plus years in American institutions now to to our society. So you, know, you literally have young people today that are saying, "Hey, I'm not going to get out of the private sector and work because that's too hard. I'm going to get a government job." You know, so so the the reliance on growing government, the more people working in government, the more people that turn away from the private sector, it, it, it's 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 really bad for our system. Hey, Alex, this is John Gilstrap. Good morning. <clears throat> I want to shift from the theoretical to the practical. You yeah. talk about, you, uh, among, I think it was the first goal that you mentioned, maybe it was the second goal that you mentioned, was to return to regular order in, in, in government in the House if, if you're elected. And then very shortly thereafter, you uh, mentioned to uh, having to um, overturn or deal with the current treasonous administration. Well, that's pretty inflammatory language. So sure. in order to return to regular order, we're going to have to start dealing with compromise, you know, at the national level and more and more at the state level, I fear. But at the national level, politics has become firewalled where nobody talks to each other. And consequently, we don't have regular order. So what is your plan uh, to to marshal the the political forces to find middle ground because you're going to have to find middle ground you can't have it all your way so what is your your plan as a member of the house of representatives to find that middle ground to actually get things done well first we're going to have to expose the failed ideology and the failed thinking of the left we're going to have to demonstrate to the american people and have people like myself go take on these individuals that continue to want to undermine our country and just destroy the, the foundation of our country. So it's going to be a, 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 an argument at first, and, and I'm not going to sit here and, and, and pretend that we're not going to have to have numbers. We're obviously not going to be able to reduce government the way we have to reduce it with a Democrat president or gridlocked government. We're going to have to win the House. We're going to have to win the Senate. We're going to have to win the presidency if we're going to be able to quickly and accurately attack the problems in this nation. So, you know, the first answer right away is we're not going to be able to reduce this ridiculous size of government until we get the numbers. Um, 
so so right off the bat, it's going to be getting the numbers to be able to fix anything quickly. Uh, there's not going to be a world where this gets fixed or where government, government gets reduced in, in a gridlock or divided government. Um, the the other part of that, though, is, is obviously, you know, right now it's it's popular not to be cooperative in the United States Congress. Uh, and it's it's getting even you know, you, it's, it's even harder to cooperate now in the U.S. Congress than it just was maybe a year or two ago. Um, and we're going to have to get real leadership in the, in the speaker. We're going to have to get a speaker that says no, we'll shut it down if we're not going to return to regular order. We're going to have to get a speaker that can not only unite more moderate Republicans and conservatives, but the entire conference. We have to get somebody that's capable of leading the entire conference. And then on top of that, they have to also be able to lead Democrats as well if we're in the majority. So we, we have to find a speaker that's going to be committed to putting his foot down and saying, this is going to stop now. We're not going to continue with continuing resolutions. We're not going to continue with omnibus packages. We're not going to continue with wasteful, abuseful spending. We're not going to do it. So, so you know, I'll tell you right now, we're going to need the numbers to, to be able to actually get this government back on track. Uh, and that's why it's so important uh, that everybody goes out and votes Republican in, in, in this election, because this election, one of the reasons I'm running, John, is because I believe we're in the final hours of this republic. Well, Our experiment has gotten so far off track that we have to get serious change immediately. You're, you're talking to a West Virginian audience right here. So this, this seat that you're running for, in all likelihood, unless the earth gets knocked off its axis, the, this seat is going to go to a Republican. So yes. I, my question is actually, why this Republican? What are, what are you going to do to make all of this happen? I'm, I'm going to go take on the radical left. I'm going to, I'm going to get with like-minded colleagues in Washington, D.C., and sit down and hammer out language on a border proposal. I'm going to craft legislation to secure the border. I'm going to stand up and beat the drum as loud as possible until everyone understands the importance of returning to regular order. The importance of if, if we don't return to regular order, we will never tackle the debt. The debt will continue to balloon because what happens is Senate leadership tells the House and the remaining members of the Senate tells the Congress how they're going to go how they're going to vote, what we're going to do. And what we've done now for almost three decades is continuing resolutions into omnibus packages. And they pass these omnibus packages, and and, and then they're filled with all kinds of ridiculous spending that that we can't afford as a country. And they're all complicit on it. So, I I mean, immediately, it's going to, I'm going to be a a, a much different bird there than what they have there currently. I I mean, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the mat on these issues. I'm going to craft legislation to fix these problems. I'm going to, uh, you know, try to get uh, collaboration on as, as, as much as possible to get to get solutions in place. I know what solutions we need for some of these problems. I know in plain, I know, you know we're never going to fix the border of the illegal immigration in this country until we dismantle the concept of asylum illegally in the United States, until we form a mass deportation task force and get some of these people, a lot of these 15 million plus that have come into this country over the Biden administration out of here. You know, I, these are things that we have to do now. I mean, like I said, we're, we're coming to the end of our republic if we don't get serious, uh, serious course change right now. And, and I think I'm the best to be able to make that happen. I also think I'm the best to be able to bring results to my district. My district is reeling. It's hurting. It's under an unemployment assault. It's, it's, it's been hollowed out for decades, as long as I've been alive. And at this point, West Virginians need to ask themselves, are we going to take a chance and vote for somebody that isn't from the political class and see what he can do? Or are we going to go with the same names in West Virginia politics and hope that things change in the state? But I can tell you one thing. They're probably not going to change if we keep electing the same people, because I've been witnessing it, John, my whole life. It's been going on here for a long, long time. We elect the same people and nothing gets done. Country gets worse. West Virginia gets worse. And they keep showing up saying, hey, elect us. And we keep doing it. And I decided that I was going to stand up this time and give the, give the voters of West Virginia's second congressional district a real choice. A young conservative and go fight for them or establishment politicians from family political legacies. 
elites. What do you want to do? You know, do you want to go with the elites or do you want to go with somebody that's not in that in that group? On on your website, um, I, I see among your issues here on education. You're behind creating a two-track learning experience that starts in the ninth grade with the pathways that include a traditional path and a vocational path, and then goes on to um, elaborate on that more. Are you in favor of a federal Department of Education? No. needs abolished immediately. Oh, um, so how do, we, couple, how do we establish these two tracks? Is that a, is that a federal program or... Yeah, it, it, it could be a, it could be federal legislation. It could also be state legislation. Basically, what I'm saying, whether it's it's education at the federal level or the state level, is there needs to be some sort of two track system. But I'm in favor of abolishing the education uh, department completely. Therefore, I don't believe the federal government should have really anything to do with education policy. I believe education policy is a state's rights issue, um, and and that that would be something that if we were to craft national education legislation, that's where we would need to start because it is quite clear that our education system in the United States is failing. In West Virginia, it's failed, but it's getting close to being failed nationally. And you can see this through a variety of, of different metrics and, and uh, results that have come out in really the last 10 years, just not since the pandemic. I mean, it, you know, people have, have, have had a really tough time in the public schools. Uh, it's kind of crazy to believe that I, I grew up in a, in a time where you know, we were in the golden era of public schools in West Virginia. Um, so, so, yeah, we have to get a, a two-track system, and, and that could be national legislation, obviously, or state legislation. Um, but but that is, that's more or less where I'm trying to let voters know this is what we have to do. This is a solution to, to allowing our workforce to be more reliable, more skilled, educated, uh, and, and it will give people, I think, a, a better idea and more clarity when they do graduate from high school, hey, I was actually good at uh, shop class. I was actually good in HVAC class. I was good in auto repair class. I was good with soldering uh, and, and, and different sorts of uh, work. So, you know, we need to give people more inspiration early on. Somebody like me is different. I knew, you know, I wanted to be a leader in politics from the time I was a small age, but there's a lot of people that don't know what they want to do when they're in high school or when they graduate high school. And we have to do a better job of facilitating an environment where they have a better idea when they get out. They're more imaginative. They can do things. And a two-track system has to be the way for, for a better workforce, especially in West Virginia. We are just about out of time. Alex, final word is yours. I hope the Eastern Panhandle will vote for me. I will work extremely hard for the people of the Eastern Panhandle. The Eastern Panhandle is probably the most important part of our state right now. We have got to get locality pay at the state level. I'll do whatever I can from a federal office to pressure state lawmakers, and even my office helped craft legislation with state lawmakers to bring locality pay, because what I don't want to see is that area, like a lot of areas in West Virginia, start to go the other way and get drained, because you're not able to com compete and keep up with the cost of living in the different, uh, different uh, environment that's around you. Uh, so I want the people of the Eastern Panhandle to go out and to vote for generational change, vote for a young, energetic conservative that can go fight for you, secure the border, tackle the debt. And, and I'll, I'll tell you something. If I win on Election Day, my first stop will be in Martinsburg. Alex, two questions for you from our audience very quickly. Uh, one, what is the price of gas in Elkins? Any idea? I'm in Parkersburg, so I, I was just – I actually stuck the ground with some signs uh, in Elkins and uh, Grant County and, and over that way. Uh, on Monday, and I didn't quite catch the uh, catch the the gas price in Elkins, but Elkins gas price typically lower um, than than a lot of uh, surrounding areas. Not sure why that is, but uh, uh, I don't I don't know I don't know the answer to that question right now. All right, and the second one is, what's your favorite fishing hole in Elkins? Oh, Bowden for sure. Uh, that's what Brad yeah. Knoll said you'd say. So yeah, all right, that works. Yeah. Yeah, best fishing in the entire uh, entire state. Entire state there. It's a, it's an amazing place to fish. Good. Shouldn't have said that out loud. Good hatchery. Hey, uh, Alex. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Rob. Have a great day.